This is part two of a two-part video series on the use of GEIS mapping for genealogy using the case study of Aaron Hunt of Bath, New Hampshire. What you're looking at right now is a hillshade image of the area that we're interested in. Uh, this shows relief only. Uh, this is a LiDAR image, so the vegetation has been stripped away, and it will show us the uh, underlying features of the landscape. Another layer that can be added here as the water features. Uh, the Connecticut River is the western boundary of Bath, and there's a tributary of the Connecticut called the Ammanusic River that flows through Bath. So we can locate the town using the boundaries, and this gives us an idea of the area we're studying here in northern New Hampshire along the Connecticut Valley. So we do have some historical maps to help us in addition to our um, research into the deed records. We know that in 1860, the land that used to belong to Aaron Hunt's family was owned by two men named Bartlett and Lang. And we can zoom into that area of interest to see uh, where those houses might be located. The feature with all the radiating lines is Gardner Mountain. Um, it is a little bit inaccurately located here, but what you can see is there's a house labeled W. Lang and a house labeled S. M. Bartlett going off of two dead-end roads. If we zoom out a little bit, it'll probably be a little bit easier to read. This will not show up on the final map. It's really part of the source material uh, that we're using to develop our final GIS map. And what's also of interest here is that W. Lang shows up on three houses and Samuel Bartlett shows up on two houses. So we need to be sure we're looking at the right two houses and deed and map research will tell us that. Um, another thing uh, regarding the lands, the former Hunt lands, is that it could be useful to look at aerial imagery that shows ground cover. And the reason for that is you can sometimes discern um, boundaries, stone walls, fence rows, that kind of thing. So this is the ground cover image. The area of interest is here. And as you can see, there are many small trails running through this property. That's evidence of logging. Uh, this has been timber property for quite some time now. It's uh, been overgrown since the days when it was farmed, when the Hunts owned it. And there was also a surface mine on this property. So the landscape has been disrupted quite a bit. Um, you know, you can get an indication of maybe a boundary here, but it isn't enough for us to locate the hunt lands accurately, but in other case studies it would be. So it's useful to have the different layers to look at. And often we look at layers that aren't necessarily the final answer. Um, what we do need to do is to try to locate features accurately in our final map. And a map that helps us to do that is the 1941 topographic map. And what we see here is one of the two dead end roads that we saw on the 1860 map. By 1940, the houses were no longer there and only the one dead end road was there, probably due to the mining operation that started in the 1870s and continued on and off into the early 20th century. Uh, this road is kind of a dome shape. This is called Carby Road. That's an abandoned road in the present. The road here with the houses along it is West Bath Road, and that still is a public road and has some of the relevant houses of the people who were the neighbors of the hunt. So this map, its function in our case study is to locate the features accurately that we need to see the neighborhood of the hunt lands in 1840. So by doing all of the research, uh, we have found out that there is a parcel in the present that was uh, the hunt lands. Part of it was the hunt lands. So we're going to uh, make that par parcel visit visible. It's called the Buck Forsyth lot. And we can see it in relation to the road networks. These are the modern roads. So the modern road comes close to it. And in fact, there is a logging access here to this timberland. And that may, may be a significant fact. Um, but we can see that um, the roads that did go to it uh, are no longer there, but we can locate them using the 1941 map. The other features that we need here, are of course, the house locations, which we got by uh, 
looking at the um, topographic map and looking at the 1860 map for the names. So we can populate all of those houses on the map now. And we do see that there are two houses within the former Hunt lands, and those were the houses labeled um, Bartlett and Lang. So we're zeroing in on the answer here. Um, and what we can do is we can go to the map layout. When we do a final map, we put it in layout form so the scale remains consistent and uh, we are able to locate all features, put in labels and, and that kind of thing. So we did that here. And uh, what we see, Gardner Mountain is labeled and you can see the hillshade image of it. Um, Bartlett and Lang houses, the Buck Forsyth lot. Timothy Buck's house is right here. And if you recall in a part one video, the order of enumeration went from uh, Lang to Hibbard to Buck to Aaron Hunt and David Sutherland, who owned the land in 1840, and then the other homeowners, Walker and uh, Lang and so forth, were picked up after that. So this is evidence that supports the conclusion that Aaron Hunt lived on the lands that had belonged to his father, Zebulun, and his brother, Nathan. One thing I do want to point out, there is a note here that John Weeks in 1840 owned one of the homes that Lang owned in 1860. And on the 1860 map, he's shown close to the boundary between uh, Bath and Monroe. So all of the uh, homeowners that are cited in the 1840 census record are right in this area. And the ones surrounding Aaron Hunt are the owner of his family's former land and the nearest neighbor. So that is good evidence that uh, Aaron Hunt lived on the lands of his family.